So hello everyone, a warm welcome to you all. I'm Akash Srida Mozu, convener of Asia Pacific Young Greens Network. The APYGN is an organization of all Young Greens, the youth wing of green parties in the Asia Pacific region. We are really excited to have you all for the first webinar of this year. We have launched this new webinar series to raise awareness about green politics and its six principles and to increase youth political participation in our region especially. The theme of today's panel discussion is the role of youth in bringing the political change in the Asia Pacific region in the era of populism, climate emergency, and raising inequalities. We have three speakers with us today for the panel discussion. The whole session will be moderated by Aya Abudai, co convener of APGM. During the first part of the session, each speaker will share their perspective on the whole theme. And followed by that, we have panel discussion, which also includes QA. So, Without further ado, I'll let, let us begin our session. Over to Aya, now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Akash. Uh, welcome everyone. This is our first uh, webinar for this, uh, for this year. And it's about the role of youth in bringing political change in the Asia Pacific region in the era of populism, climate emergency, and rising inequality. So the nature and human rights are in jeopardy, jeopardy in the 21st century. Our politicians and policymakers have largely ignored the world's current social, economic, and environmental crises. In the global south, particularly in Asia Pacific, countries are struggling to develop sustainably. All the odds are stacked against us. Populism is eroding democracy in our countries. The climate catastrophe is turning our world, world into a toxic environment. And the growth model of, econom of economics is raising inequalities of income, wealth, and opportunity. Amidst all of these issues, our lives are motivated solely by the hope of a better future. To address the grave challenges of sustainable development in the Asia Pacific region, we must strive for political change. Since youth engagement is essential in turning vision to action, they should step up to bring about the much needed political and policy level changes. I'd like to welcome all of the speakers. Thank you all for joining us today. Sabatha, Dubna, Rula. I'll be uh, introducing each of you and uh, I'll give you a few minutes so that you can talk more about yourself because I, I know that there's a lot more to talk about you. <laughs> so I'll start with uh, Rula Azar Douglas. Uh, she is a Lebanese Canadian author, journalist, lecturer and researcher. She has two novels to her credit, as well as hundreds of published articles and many contributions to national and international anthologies. She's committed to combat discrimination and, and injustice wherever she sees them. Rola writes to trigger reflections to contribute to the evolution of mentalities and to the development of new approaches for achieving gender equality and social justice. Rola teaches journalism and writing at Saint Joseph University and the Lebanese University. She is also in charge of a weekly page on universities and youth at the leading French speaking newspaper, Lorient Le Jour. Rula, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Aya. Thank you. There's, there's also one thing, which is uh, the book that you wrote about Le jour où le soleil ne s'est pas levé, which is the day the sun didn't rise. Can you talk to us about it a bit more? Yes, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to tackle the subject of euthanasia, you know, al maut rahim in Arabic. The, the, when we help people when they are in terminal illnesses, you know, to go in peace. And it's a subject that the Lebanese society is not really ready yet to talk about. So I chose to choose, you know, fiction to make people think about it and to see that, you know, things are not either white or black and that we have the right and we should, you know, keep this freedom to decide on each situation what would be the best for our loved ones. So I know it's not really a positive thing to do, but you know, 
now with the pandemic and everything you see how death is near and close all the time and it's part of life and I think that accepting this and accepting to talk about such difficult matters is helpful for society. Thank you, thank you. This is actually an important uh, point, which is when are we ready to talk about the the stereotypical or even the taboo uh, subjects in our society? It's a very good. It's a it's a very good point. So uh, thank you again, Rola. I'll move forward to the, Dr. Lubna Sarwat. I hope that I'm uh, pronouncing your last name correctly. Yeah, you're right, Aya. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Lubna Sarwat is from Hyderabad, and she is the first woman in India to obtain, to obtain a PhD in Islamic economics. That is amazing. <laughs> she is a well-being economist and socio-environmental socio -envi activist. And in Hyderabad, Lubna is the founder and director of the Center for Wellbeing Economics and the founder and general secretary of Shausa Foundation. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Shausa. I, I thought so. It sounds like an Arabic word. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So she's also the former convener for Save, Save Our Urban Lakes from 2013 till 2018. She won the Best Economist 2012 award for her presentation entitled Small is Big, Non-Inclusive Wellbeing of India at the Economics Debate Panel uh, that was conducted by Indo-Kuwait Friendship in Kuwait in January 2013. She has many published articles and two books on economics and environment to be published soon. They're still be, they're, did they get published yet <laughs> in, the, in these two weeks? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Can you talk? Can you talk about about the books a bit more and how you came to be where you are now? Like I know that you were a former banker. So how did you make the change? And what what about those books that you're trying you're going to publish? Yeah. Um, the point is that uh, as in uh, as a banker. Uh, I understood uh, both through my uh, faith, the book Quran, and also through Keynes, the, the famous economist of our world, we understand that uh, interest-based economics is not good for the world. And we are actually facing the consequences today, uh, wherein so many poor countries in Africa, Asia, uh, they are not uh, able to service their debts properly. And at individual level, as well as at the country level, Debt servicing is something that eats away the country's progress. So uh, given this, in spite of me being selected with a very high ranking as a, um, at a managerial cadre in the bank, I still quit it after a period of say seven to eight years. Uh, then I thought, uh, uh, then I went ahead to do my PhD in, uh, uh, in Jakarta, Trisakti University in Indonesia. Uh, under the supervision of uh, a world leading mathematician and economist, Professor Masudul Alam Chaudhary. It was an international program. And uh, there, uh, again, we, I saw how uh, the um, Islamic economics was my specialization there. And I saw that uh, how due to lack of uh, including various factors that actually impact a particular decision, due to not reckoning all those factors, the policy outcome is also was very lopsided. And it was hypocritical. So that I exemplified and it uh, was published in the Intech Open also in Europe. It was published in Europe. Uh, and uh, a small exam, critical example that I would like to give us um, and very shortly is that when you have the World Poverty Councils or the World Environmental Councils, whether it's COP26 or the upcoming COP27, at any time, these two factors are not reckoned. When you talk about the environment, the war industry and the pollution caused by the war industry is never talked about because there are big top players who are in the war industry, in the war manufacturing industry. And the second point is when there is the World Co Poverty Council also, you will see that never this war industry that actually within seconds causes a, a middle class or a rich person also or a middle class person to become poor within minutes. 
We saw that in Ukraine. We saw that in Yemen. We are seeing that in Palestine. And yet, they never dare bring the war industry on the table of discussion. So a factor which is causing poverty, a factor which is causing the environmental pollution is not brought to the table for discussion and not taken as a factor impacting it. Then how do you think that the policy that's coming out of it would be a sound one, would be a profound one? So this is what I discussed in my thesis also. And this is what led me to, uh, I mean, uh, champion for the environment because without environment, because I believe in environment is de development and ecology is economy. And uh, I believe in ethics because technology also cannot be ethics neutral. Everything has to be, has to go through the filter of ethics. And that's how I'm into economics, environment and ethics. Wonderful. This is beautiful. I love how every you you connected everything. It's it's beautiful how you're making those connections. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you. And now, uh, Tabitha, Tabitha uh, is an ambitious, optimistic go-getter who has worked in both the climate and youth activism advocacy circle, circles. She is well known within within the political sphere volunteering in many different campaigns where she has developed great skills in leadership, communication, and collaboration. Tabitha believes that the ability to think ethically, shop ethically, and live ethically should be a priority in creating a prosperous and equitable society and is currently not attainable for most people around the world. Tabitha has been an organizer with School, for, school Strike for Climate on a local level and currently works with EcoCircle International. Tabitha is also involved in the inaugural South Australian Youth Forum alongside with the Youth Affairs Council, South Australia, I guess, <laughs> okay. which helps to, to enfranchise and empower youth to speak up about what they're passionate and concerned about. She has experienced in youth leadership, participating in both youth parliament in 2020 and 2021, and UN youth events, including the UN South, uh, South Australia Conference and the UN National Conference. In, the, in just the past year, Tabata has received both the UN Youth Global, Award, Global Citizen Award for her extended and enthusiastic work with the UN Youth and the Australian Defense, Defense Force Long Tang, Long Tan Award, which recognizes students who demonstrate leadership and teamwork both within the school and the broader local community. So Tabitha, thank you for joining, joining us and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Can you give us, uh, thank you. <laughs> Can you give us uh, more, uh, can you talk to us about the sectors of environment, the gender and sexual identi identity issues, the housing and minimum wages, all the issues that uh, impact the youth and that, that you're, active, you're an activist about to try to support slash change those uh, issues from being? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you said, I'm part of School Strike for Climate. Um, and in South Australia, we are actually the leaders of the country within the um, climate action sphere. And so we want to see more and more of that happening within Australia. And so School Strike aims to um, organise beach cleanups, to plant trees, to organise protests within the community um, to try and get that action. Another point you mentioned was housing affordability, which if anyone has tried to buy a house recently or has gone through that process, it is in absolute dire straits. Like we've never seen it before, especially after COVID um, and the inability to um, earn more than minimum wage that will actually cover those costs. And so just trying to implement um, solutions and try and figure out how to you know, combat these issues as young people is um, definitely very important. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you even for your work. <laughs> it's important work. All right, so uh, I'm Aya Abdulni. I am a member of the Green Party of Lebanon. I am also a, mem a member representative of the Green 
Green, Young Greens of Lebanon and the Asia Pacific Young Greens Network. I'm also the co-convener of the Asia Pacific Greens Federation. So welcome all. And I'd like to wish everyone um, Ramadan Mubarak. It started yesterday. And I'd like to wish everyone uh, a happy and Mubarak Ramadan full of uh, faith, prayers, and goodness. Thank you, Aya. Thank you. So let's start. Yeah, Let's no. talk about the elections and the journey of youth and political participation. Tabitha, I'd like to ask you this because of your journey with the youth. How does youth political participation differ from adult political participation? What have you seen throughout your experience, throughout your journey as a youth activist? That's a great question. Um, I think the main difference that I've seen within adults and young people is that young people come up with the best ideas. They are the most creative in their solutions. They know how to deliver. And unfortunately, sometimes our politicians don't match that energy and they don't come in with the big ideas. They come in with things that will get them the next election. And so I think that's the biggest difference. And that's what adults need to focus on with talking and discussing with young people is number one, how to get their vote, because obviously that's how they get elected and make change, but also things that are important to them because obviously different issues impact different generations. And so just trying to find out what the best solution is for everyone involved. I am muted. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, follow up question, how can youth fight the political imbalance of power and the inequity in the distribution of representation when it comes to youth representation? Um, another very good question. I think <laughs> that I think that it is incredible the Empower, power imbalance especially in Australia you know you have youth advisors and youth committees and you know they make recommendations but how often do we actually see the government acting on those recommendations and how often do we actually see those in power really consulting their communities and so I think the best way that young people can be involved and you know get more into that political space is just talking to them they are you know, politicians, they are people, they are there to represent your views and they're yeah, meant to hear you and talk to you and listen to you and then use that when they come to make decisions. And so I think that's just the best thing that we can do as young people is make our opinions known, make us heard, use our voices very loudly um, and just try and get more, I guess, sway in that way. Yeah, I definitely see that. They, there's there's a lot of, uh, we reached a point where the people who, when when we look at the people who are in the government as as politicians in the government, we just see like, they're untouchable. It's like, it's not, they're humans, just like us, we can, we can talk to them. We don't need to go to extreme measures so that they can hear us. Like sometimes yeah, it backfires on us. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So, Lubna, going to you, <laughs> how can youth participate in politics and contest in elections when they're surrounded by a society that forces them to focus on being financially independent at an early stage of their life? This is a question regarding both your experience from the bank and outside of it. <laughs> this is a very important question, honestly, from my side. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This is a very, very relevant question uh, of much more, uh, not just in the Indian context, but across the globe. As Tabitha also has pointed out, some critical things on the politicians. So uh, here, I would like to underscore one point. You know, the youth uh, from uh, India is a very young country. We have more than uh, sixty-five percent to seventy percent. Our country's uh, the population range is. Uh, <clears throat> between uh, 14 to 50 or uh, so, 50 to 60. India is a very young country. 
what i would like to say here is the uh, these young people are mostly faced by the two critical questions as they grow up and they come to realize things around their world both the questions are relating to marx and money they are the two ms that dominate their whole life matter of fact until a certain student age they are always critical the family and the peers and the friends are all asking them as to what are their grades how many marks have they obtained that is the only critical question they always face it's not about what is the subject you learned what is the new thing that you learned how are you correlating your subjects to your society there is never never any critical question the only question will be about the first m in their life that is marks now as what as part of your other part of the question answer to that is after a certain age now it becomes critical for them after a certain graduation stage or a cert, even before that or later high after higher education stage now it is about the second m that dominates now the entire life and that is money so how much have you earned everybody in the family outside the family peer pressure everything is about how much of money are you earning it's not about how what is your service you are in whether it is whether it is sciences or any other services how are you contributing to the society uh, how is how is yours is 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 yours ethically sound what are the problems of the society your company is resolving it's not at all on these terms it is about how much of money or is the package that you got how much of money are you earning it is just about this and now comes the other critical point that the challenge that a youth is facing actually the media that you know what media is a catalyst recently when i had my um, open press meet also the last press meet was on 1st of uh, april okay uh, 31st of march just 3 days back so 31st of march also and even before that i was trying to push in a narrative telling that the ppp which is showed across the globe as a public private partnership in the to uh, to push through uh, projects you know all these uh, infrastructure projects so i formed a new narrative i told it is about the people politician and the press this has to be the new this is the new jargon that we are going to place and we are going to create this narrative that it is the people press and politician narrative that this this sort of a connection that has to develop that is very critical so now coming uh, again to that point why i brought in at that point was that because the accessibility of the politician and the frame that the young young minds are facing when they get on to the media because the media is the main uh, critical catalyst between the people and the politician people and the governance and anything at all so when we go when a young mind or the old mind is looking to the media the media is churning out advertisement upon advertisement it is mainly about if you look at any 90% of the advertisements are dominated by the car industry the, that's the automobile industry the housing industry the finance industry the insurance industry and the pharma industry now if you look at a little bit of i research also will do will tell that this is 90% of the ads are dominated by this now this is the frame that the young mind is facing apart from the peer pressure of the two ms of money and marks the only things that he is seeing through the media is this that the house the car the pharma the insurance and the all, the, all these other other world that he is looking at and the aspiration is now that this is the world that i need to get into when am i i am recognized by acquiring this world so now how does he acquire that world it is only through the yam that is money so that becomes the focus and the industry is the nexus between the banking pharma housing and all these automobile sectors this nexus is such that they are pumping so many of advertisements and they hunt for young people who are earning so that their business and their industry is always flourishing so who flourishes their industry is this young people who have strove, strove all through their life for marks and money they are the oil for these industries so now 
when you talked in the opening sentences about the inequitability, about the environment degradation, about the social uh, also, uh, the fabric of the society being not being very congenial to everybody, to the minorities or to anybody else, or to people who think a little differently, this is the frame that is being given, that is being sold out and being consumed by the youth. Now I will tell you another important critical point where they, if had there been an opening, another sort of an openings, then maybe the youth would also think of that because that frame is not in front of the youth today. That frame is when I, during my research, I found out that the Oman parliament had a specific thing. Now, for example, if the youth in Hyderabad, people like Akarsh and other youth, if they want to, uh, the politicians are already there with their set of mind, with their party whips, with their party commands. So they are not able to go beyond that. Now, suppose people like Akarsh want something to be debated in the assembly. None of the politicians are listening to him. We don't have a provision in the Indian parliament or in various parliaments across the globe wherein the citizen can actually put up a direct question to the running assembly or to the running parliament. We do not have this provision. Oman has that provision. Oman, apart from the geographical demarcated uh, vilayats, they are called vilayats, and apart from the people who represent them in the assembly, Apart from that, there is a particular committee sitting in the parliament, sitting in the assembly, which takes direct questions from the citizen, and then they vet the question, and then they put it before the assembly for the answers to be given back to the citizens. So this is the side, sort of democratic interventions that can pull the youth towards the politics, that can pull the youth towards questioning the governance and not accepting the status quo. Today, the challenge is that the youth are feeling that oh, anyway, nothing is going to happen. The sort of a depressed feeling that nothing is going to happen. So let me be in the game to acquire marks and money any which way. The thing is any which way. So there, what the chief casualty there is the ethics. And today, because of ethics, our environment degrades, our society is defabricated, and our economy is totally, totally inequitable with, you know, one is to 99, you know everything. Each time Oxfam is delivering the tables, delivering the figures to us. And uh, the eighth uh, um, largest, richest person of the world is from India, where we have the Asia's biggest slum. Why does the slum continue to be the biggest slum over decades? Why is it not being transformed into something else? Because why I talk about the Asia's biggest slum in Bombay is that that is the house to the world's eighth richest person and the Asia's richest person, the Ambani's. So the biggest slum is there. The richest person, eighth richest person of the world and the richest person of Asia is there. So this is the sort of inequity that we're seeing. And it is only and only because we lack ethics and ethics has to be everywhere, whether it is science or technology or the human thoughts and the policies, everything has to be going through the filter of ethics. Otherwise, we are not short of resources, nor neither natural resources, nor human resources. We are not short of anything. It is only that we are short of ethics that we are seeing all these tragedies that are unfolding before us every moment in the world. Yeah. I totally agree. I can see what you're talking about, especially, uh, especially that now, now that you said it, actually, uh, I noticed that before we were, there was a high level of product consumption, while actually now it has evolved to the state that we're being sold our comfort, we're being sold our safety, while actually it's a right, we shouldn't be sold those things. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Like I can see it. Uh, I can see it in Lebanon. Seeing as we have currently, we're going through a very unstable. Uh, get close to something that is uh, our right to get. We get sold that right, and we're reminded that this was given to you by this person. So you should give something back while actually it's just a right. It's as, as simple as that, the basic rights. It's uh, it's concerning that this is recurrent in different countries. 
and it's happening even wider than the Middle East, wider than than the global south. It's starting to affect the global north, and it's uh, mind blowing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Rula, I have a question for uh, the participation in activism. Is that okay? So, there are many young people who are actively participating in activism but they are not willing to contest in elections and we can see that a lot in Lebanon. How can we change this scenario and what may be the reasons and how can young adults develop political attitudes? If you'd like, you can talk about the global context and you can even uh, target the, the Lebanese context, but you're muted. You're, Sorry, I just, yeah, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you know, okay. you told me that I can talk globally and you are right because there are some common uh, reasons. Uh, we can change the scenario by first establishing what are the reasons behind this why do young people who are so active uh, in the street, you know, on social media, why don't they run for office? Usually there are many barriers to political participations and they occur at different levels. I can think about, you know, three levels, let's say at the individual level, at the structural level, and I will explain each one of them quickly, and at the organizational level. I will try to be clear, you know, and quick to give you the, the chance to ask all the questions that you have in mind. And uh, your questions are also smart and in interesting. Thank you, Aya. At the individual level, there is a distrust. So young people have a distrust, and they are right, I think. A they distrust, uh, they have a distrust in political institution. Sometimes, sometimes it's not your case, neither the one of our interesting speaker, Tabita, this is not your case for sure, neither this of Dr. Lobna, but sometimes they lack uh, uh, knowledge about political processes. And sometimes, oh. sometimes they lack access to political information, it depends. Uh, and there is a certain uh, marginalization. I think Tabita talked a little bit about it. There are young people are sometimes marginalized. And even when media, uh, I do agree with Dr. Lubna a lot on the role of media. And even when media sometimes they interview young people, they often categorize them in certain categories. And uh, they insist sometimes on the generational change instead of really focusing on all what they can bring to society, all what they can give. Tabita talked about their crea creativity, about their force. I do agree with her. I do agree that they have a lot to give us. And I do agree with Dr. Lubna on the role of media to be able to shed light on them. And this, if you can allow me, uh, Aya, I would open a bracket and invite you to meet one of uh, the journalists in my team. I, I will invite her to meet with you and to interview for an, uh, interview you for an article in Lorient Le Jour to shed light on your political participation and on your role, you know, uh, what you do in your party, the Green Party. Now, this being said about the individual reasons, there are some structural, you know, uh, reasons or, or reasons on the structural level. I can think about the age requirement to vote, you know, in Lebanon, it's 21 years old. Uh, in many countries, it's slower. And here we are thinking in Lebanon about lowering this. But there are many other, you know, reasons that would prevent polit politicians to accept it. It's related to demography. You know how the country is composed with different confession uh, communities and all those, you know, fictive maybe tensions that are used by politicians in order to manipulate us more. But I can think also about, you know, your first question and what uh, your question about the cost of being nominated, the cost of being uh, to uh, the cost that will the cost to run for office, you know, sometimes it costs a lot of money and parties do not all the time, you know, support or the government do not all the time support candidates. But I can think also about social and cultural traditions and society views that view uh, young people as being 
immature. I'm sorry, this is not my view at all. <laughs> but you know, this is the reality. We have to admit it that a lot of people have a condescendent, you know, look on young people and they don't listen enough to them and they don't really hear their voices. At the organizational level, uh, we have limited data on youth political participation. As a journalist now, if I want to have more information, more accurate information on the subject in Lebanon in order to see what is the real problem and to try to find solutions, I don't have, we have limited access to data. And, uh, you know, and often youth are associated with other underrepresented groups. So we don't give them enough, you know, if you want uh, consideration to their specific needs. And I think Tabitha talked a little bit about their specific, you know, uh, the, the specific causes that are important to them. So it's important to see their specificity and to try, you know, to tackle it. So it's not, you know, you talked about time, Aya, and you were absolutely right, but you were talking about something else, you know, we we're talking about euthanasia, but you are absolutely right when we talk about time, because when is the priority to, uh, to really encourage and to really push for youth participation? When we talk about this in Lebanon or somewhere else, they would say it's not a priority now. For me, it is the priority and it should be now. It should, it should have been yesterday, not today. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Tabitha, you'd like to respond? Yes, um, thank you, Rula. I thought that everything that you said was pretty spot on, especially, I mean, even in Australia. Um, and I thought it was interesting that the voting age um, in Lebanon is 21, because in Australia it's 18 and, you know, even some of us think that's too low, like too high. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, what I kind of wanted to say on it was that the discrepancy between you know, people participating in strikes and petitioning is so different from people um, contesting elections. But I think one of the major reasons for that is the lack of representation in our parliaments right now. I think that, especially in Australia, the lack of representation of women, um, of our First Nations Indigenous communities um, and of people with disabilities. Um, they are all so underrepresented in Parliament. And I think that that issue kind of further reinforces the idea of, well, I'm not even going to try because, you know, the system is not representative of me now. And so I'm not even going to get in. There's no point. Um, but for there to be active change, we need to challenge that. Women need to challenge that. People with disabilities need to challenge that. Our Indigenous Aboriginal folks need to challenge that because it's not going to change if we don't try. Absolutely. I do agree with you, Tabitha. Thank you, Rula and Tabitha. Uh, so, Lubna, I, I have one last question about the section. Uh, how can we remove the corporate power from politics? You, um, you, you previously pointed out parts of that question. I'm, 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 I see that you're ready to answer that question. Can you please answer that question? <laughs> no, the situation is actually very bad on that front in India. It took a very, very regressive, uh, um, uh, we are in a very regressive mode. Uh, as far as corporate uh, or corporate uh, dominance in the political, uh, I wouldn't say decisions, but uh, I would say in the political financing. It has taken a very regressive form in India because we have something called as electoral bonds. Okay. And uh, these electoral bonds have been resisted by the Election Commission of India. Uh, but the um, regime went ahead with it and it is such that the electoral bonds can be purchased by anybody, any corporate, but it will never be known to any public in India. Nobody will ever know who purchased the bond and they purchase and the money went, the crores of money went to which party. Okay, we will never know which corporate actually made the donation. So much of opaqueness is there in a political party's donations. Previously, the rule was that if it is more than 20,000 Indian rupees also, the name of the donor has to be there in public domain. But now 
you donate huge crores you purchase the electoral bonds that or bond is also through a state bank of india but nobody will know and the ruling party right now which is the bjp uh, the adr the association of democratic rights and other uh, important organizations they have come up with the figures that more around 7000 crores electoral bonds have been uh, purchased and donated and the do donations went directly to the ruling party bjp so all this is what money it is not called as, it cannot be called as a legal money just because it is not being made public and anybody from outside anybody can purchase it actually and the rules were amended in the parliament so this is the sort of when you have this sort of money coming in in the most epic manner to the ruling party that is uh, actually the go government of the day uh, since 2014 so it is a uh, it is a kids uh, it can be even a school student who will tell that of course the corporate will dominate the political decisions because the money is coming from there so this is the amount of dominance that we are seeing and also another thing when e right from 2014 what we have been seeing is that when the canvassing political leaders they are traveling by in what they are traveling in whose choppers so even that is an indication of the dominance of the corporatism over there and also when we see when across the media is throwing across the whole globe or in the indian media they we see uh, pictures where all these corporate giants uh are uh, pictured along with the prime minister with the ministers with various state ministers whether it's at the telangana state level or at the india level when we see these people corporates along with the uh, politicians and the not just the politician but the leaders of the day the ministers of the day then anybody would say that the, the decisions are of course being influenced otherwise, otherwise why are they there actually so this is the sort of corporate uh, money and um, the dominance which is not at all a recommended one because our country especially i do not know the preamble of other countries but our country our constitution which i i propagate on every channel where i every platform where i say that for every indian our constitution of india is our sacred book it for every indian that's the sacred book so that is the way in which we see our book because our constitution of india is also considered by various other countries as a very very voluminous and very very profound book for the citizens now such a book is opening with the preamble that gives a direction to the government of the day to any government right from our independence till date and that has chief terms the chief out of the five terms of the preamble the most chief um, the three terms that i'm quoting here not chief all the five are important the ones are socialism which gives the direction to the government as to what to in which way the economic policy should be heading to by quoting socialism the it also talks about democracy which means there should be a huge amount of dialogue between the citizen and the government because democracy is all about dialogue so many nobel please nobel laureates of the world have told this that democracy is all about dialogue and the third is the one is about secularism which actually actually defines about the fabric of the society how closely we are how harmonized we can be because india is a wonderful wonderful country of course as an indian i would definitely tell that my country is the best because when i went to indonesia when i went to turkey and other places the beauty the of india as a live i see in india and when i go from abroad oh this is the most beautiful one step every 1 km every 2 km the type of diversity in language in dialect in religion in re region and also the culinary and the uh, landscape oh my god it is amazing till till the kiamat you know till eternity you cannot document india that's the variety india holds so the secularism or the harmony of the social fabric of society is all the more the responsibility of the government to hold it that strong with knitting it to totally and the way it is knit very well wonderfully knit my country is the day of government's responsibility is to preserve it so what i mean to tell is that this socialism which is an economic direction this democracy which is a governance direction 
and the secularism which is a societal direction for the government and apart from that we have a chapter 4 called the directive principles of the state on which it is actually telling the government that these are the directive principles upon which your policy has to be guided through. It may not be mandatory, it may not be challenged, but it is a clear direction and there are so many Supreme Court um, judgments also which actually are telling the government that these are the directive principles and you're bound by them. You have to deliver them. If you're not here to deliver them, then what are you doing? So these are the types of judgments that have come based on the constitution. So what I mean to tell is that the youth is seeing that the book is somewhere, the law is somewhere, but the practicality is something else. So that's where the dissolution creeps in, the depression creeps in. And then they tell themselves, okay, let me stick to my marks and money because I have to survival of the fittest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. So, uh, just a small, tiny break. Uh, thank you all for the first section. Uh, the first section of this webinar is done. We're going to move forward to another one. I'd just like to welcome the new participants. If you have any questions, please send them on the chat so that when the questions and answers uh, section of the webinar, uh, when we reach it, we would have your questions to answer. All right. So, um, okay. So about youth representation in government and the political impact. Uh, Rula and Tabitha, I'd like to ask this question to both of you. If you have uh, a response, please go ahead. So in the global south, especially the countries in the Asia Pacific region, uh, they're struggling with social and ecological crises, but the representation of young people in the upper and lower houses of different countries is very small. So the question is, how do we increase the participation and the representation of young people in governmental houses? Like what, what can be done in relation to all of the challenges that the youth have? How can we increase uh, the, the representation? Uh, Tabitha, do you mind if I start? Okay, okay. Uh, you know, I'll talk globally and maybe Tabitha will talk, she will decide what she wants to talk about, but maybe she will tackle, you know, specifically her region or her experience. Uh, you know, uh, so several countries have started to introduce quotas. You talked a little bit about the Tabitha, how they are underrepresented and what we do to increase it. So quotas can do, can increase, you know, the youth participation. It's not accepted everywhere. You know, Aya in Lebanon, how we are fighting for women participation. And it's very similar, you know, we are uh, uh, facing the same obstacles that a youth can find. So uh, quotas for youth to increase their participation can, is applied in Kenya and Morocco, Peru, Rwanda, and other countries in the world. There are three types of quotas. There are the reserved seats where you really uh, are sure that the youth will really arrive you know, to the parliament. Those are reserved seats for young people under, let's say, I don't know, 40 years old. It can be also, you know, uh, uh, making the parties uh, to integrate young people in their lists. And, you know, we are preparing now for the legislative uh, election soon in, the, in, in May. Do they have young people? Do we oblige them? We don't in Lebanon yet. So maybe they have, let's say, uh, to present 30% of their candidates uh, be under, let's say, a certain age. But here there's a trick also. It shouldn't be like a decorative thing, like something that they will do just to make young people quiet. It should be real. So the names should be really, uh, should be um, uh, placed, you know, in the upper part of the list in order to really uh, encourage people to see them and to vote for them. They should spend money uh, campaigning for them. It should be real, not just, you know, to uh, just to accommodate uh, uh, you know, theoretically, uh, the need of and uh, the need of society to have more uh, young people in parliament. It could be also, and we talked a little bit, lowering the age of, of voting, but also lowering the age of eligibility to run for office. I don't know whether you know, I uh, I didn't know before this conference. So thanks to you that in some countries the age to run for office is forty years old. 
Wow, that's the double maybe of the age of Tabitha. I don't know how old is Tabitha. So it's a lot, 40 years old. So let's say it's, this is in Zimbabwe. In other countries, it can be 35 or 25. Why? Why people can drive at 18 and you know they cannot run for office at 40? And why can they get married sometimes as young as nine years old in certain countries? and not being able neither to vote nor to run for office until they are much, much older. So this should change because once it changes, people would see, young people would see that this is accessible, this is open for them, they can contribute and they should contribute, we need them. Uh, young, uh, youth participation is not good only for the young people, it's good for the entire society. So it's not, it's not a favor that you are giving you if uh, once you participate, it's, a, it's something beneficial for the whole society and it's something beneficial also for the political system because no political system is correct or is, uh, is really democratic if it's not participatory and representative of all the components of society. So it's not a favor that you are giving you, it's something that we should know. And we should work on, uh, I don't know, on the relation of trust between the young people and you know the people in uh, who are governing. This would be, it, can, it will be something very difficult because myself, I'm more than the double of your age and I don't trust them. So it's not a matter of age, it's, it's, it's a matter of you know values and the way we see the world. And here I would like to applaud both Tabitha and Dr. Lubna on, on something that they talked a lot about that is really, really, really important for me. It's ethics. Dr. Lubna talked about it in you know, many ways. Ethics is really something really important and crucial for the society. And I would like to link ethics to media because media, doing media without ethics can be really disastrous and very bad for society. I hope that I have you know, answered, you know, uh, gave you elements of answers to your question, Aya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jura. Thank you. That's a very good point, the ethics. We need to remember that it's it's almost non. It's like it's painting. <laughs> Everyone is out for themselves. It. We just violate it. Here we don't talk about it. We violate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's disturbing. Tabitha. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rola, for your contribution. I think you pretty much covered all of the main components. Um, another component that. I was particularly interested in just because it is like an Australian issue, but I know it's happening around um, the rest of the world as well, is that the increasing events um, in, from climate, the climate crisis um, are putting young people in a position where along with like housing affordability, they can't really focus on things like running for, like for, running for office and running for parliament. Um, because they are so concerned of where they're going to live and especially with all the fires and floods and um, all of the disasters that are happening in Australia um, around the country they the amount of um, you know insecurity that they have is really pushing them away from politics um, so that they can earn like a stable living um, and so the idea of a political um, career is becoming less and less accessible to the youth of Australia and so I think with you know trying to fix the climate crisis which I know is a very very big step um, but if we do that I think the number of young people willing to put their hand up and say yes I will run I think that'll definitely skyrocket because they're not focused on just trying to keep themselves safe and their families safe um, but they do have that capacity to then try and keep everyone safe. Uh, definitely. Uh, one of the main elements of why uh, people don't, people in general, but more specifically young people, is the fact that they're not safe, especially when there are uh, militias that are either as political parties or even in the government. Like, you, you fear for yourself. <laughs> it's normal. So uh, definitely a great point. Thank you. Thank you, Tabitha. So, uh, Lubna, I'd like to ask you uh, a question regarding the political parties. So, we spoke about the BJP, 
and we have an idea of how uh, the BJP functions in India. So uh, let's consider that party along with the other parties in India. So what can they do as political parties in order to ensure the participation and representation of youth in the government? Um, are there are there any uh, activities that they've done, any policies that they've uh, circulated, if you know about them, that regarding the youth representation and participation in political parties or even in the government? Yeah, and uh, carrying on from the points that Tabitha and Raula have told, and also you are actually speaking through your questions, okay? And... Uh, what I would try to uh, add here is that uh, the proportional representation, if that point is taken, then surely the youth should be the majority of the parliamentarians or the people in the assembly have to be the youth. So that's a big unethi unethicality. See, when you talk about the proportional representation of regions, of religions, of the genders and all that, then uh, the a the so called uh, uh, sector of the society which we term as youth then where is their rep proportional representation in any assembly or in any parliament in? and regarding the age points that uh, brought in by raula and tabitha uh, see in india also there is a huge confusion that the youth are actually facing because our voting age has been reduced to 18 so now even a person of 18 can vote but then recently, uh, the marriageable age has been increased to 21. So people are questioning. So when the um, uh, when uh, when a person can actually decide the governance of a huge country of 135 crores can actually uh, be 18, 18 year old, uh, then uh, why shouldn't he be able to choose just his life partner at uh, 18? Okay, so see these these throw many these turn out many perspectives, many questions. See the, the I I am not bring, going to bring you any of my personal opinions, but basically all the country is thinking and where we are trying to push our country, the direction that we are giving to our country, think keeping the youth mind. You know, always we have to think about the challenges they face. As Tavita rightly pointed out, uh, and I also previously had told that they are going back to their money part of it their survival. Why? Because uh, uh, the if you want to, uh, matter of fact, uh, matter of fact, uh, you are earning. When you are a member of the parliament or member of the assembly, you are of course earning because they do get a salary. They get a hefty pensions, they get hefty salaries, they get hefty perks. But the vacancies are very small. <laughs> they are not adequate. A huge population representation is having one particular member of parliament or member of assembly. So one way of increasing the number of youth that get into actually assemblies and parliament is like, again, if I go back to Oman, Oman is like this, you know, suppose you 35,000, a population of 35,000, there is a representative, the Vilayat consisting of 35,000 has elected a particular representative to the Oman parliament then suppose the Vilayat's population increases by 35, more than 35,000, then there has to be another Vilayat. You know? It is not that the constituency population goes on bulging and there is still the same representative. So the a sort of a exercise has to be done very quickly that they should be more representatives in the parliament and the assembly and that will surely give a chance one per method of giving chance to youth. And when they are doing this delimitation exercise of actually uh, creating more and more parliament and assembly constituencies, what can be done is that you can actually uh, tell that this has to be the number of youth that we want to see in our assembly. And I mean, reserve, reserve certain seats, you know, tell that this has to be the proportion of youth in the assembly and in these days. Now coming down to the other major point, just being a youth doesn't mean that they're going to deliver us an ethical governance, is it? No. Yeah, exactly they that. <laughs> <laughs> so they may suffer the same lacuna that we are seeing in our oldie governance. 
Now, where I will tell you this point comes to, when people across the globe, and I had done a particular course called as Women in Leadership course at IIM Bangalore, which is one of the premier institutions in India. There also, when uh, they, were, um, they, they were actually routing for the gender, female governance, you know, and then I pointed out to them that uh, how are we telling that one particular gender can be, can rule, can rule or not rule or can govern ethically? Is a particular gender ethical? Is a particular age group ethical? No. Nobody is immune to corruption. At the same time, there's no age bar to being ethical, to deliver ethically under any circumstances. So how the crux of the matter is that you be ethical in governance. It's not about a particular age group or a particular gender that can deliver. And for that, again, we have to go back to our educations. Because these people, politicians, who are promising galore, they promise so many things in their, during their election speeches and in their manifestos. So they are not understanding that as a child, when a child is being brought up in the education for two places that influence the child's mind and they frame the mind actually, the boldness of spirit, the ethical ethos that form are at two stages, at the home and in the school. So at the school and at the home, are they emphasizing on the ethics of the school, of the student? Yes, marks, yes to money. Marks are very important. Money is very important. But they have to be governed and can never be ethics neutral. They have to be ethical. So this is where we have to tell them right from that stage that you, if you are a doctor, you have to be an ethical doctor, a lawyer, an ethical lawyer, a parliamentarian, a politician, an ethical politician. So much so that when you, when you don't lie to your parents, when you don't lie at the school to your teacher and to your principal and to your friends, then when you become a politician, you will never lie to your people. You will never promise that which you cannot give, which you know you cannot give. You will never promise or put in your election manifesto those things which you feel are you just telling for a vote. You will never do all that. So that's a big lie. When I was a student in my, and a child, I did a small lie. Now I become a politician, I'm doing a big lie. <laughs> so these are all the things. So everywhere it's about ethics, you know. And at the same time, another point, Election Commission of India. These in, in every, maybe in every country, they have an election commission, you know, that governs until the, all the election rules and other things. These have to be very, very strong, the uh, election rules, because they think that their duty is only to conduct the elections properly. But once they conduct the elections and taking the responsibility and they send the, this particular elected biggie into the house where he sits upon our head and governs us, there when he is committing all his mistakes, he is lying in the assembly, when he is lying on the street as an MP, as a member of the parliament, when he's lying in the parliament, when he's lying in the public speeches on the streets, who should govern him? Who should govern him or her? So the rules are absent. Youth has to play a very critical part over there. Youth has to push in all these suggestions. Yeah, all of these, uh, in addition to holding people responsible, this is something that uh, we rarely see. Unfortunately, even uh, when it comes to international organizations that are supposed to hold the peace, nobody's held responsible. And if they are, things are being done in a very sensitive way and things are done, they, they take time, I understand that. But in the end, we, we don't see anyone who being held responsible. And so yes. history is repeating itself several times. And it's you know, enough. Yes. You know, enough is yeah. Enough. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's actually very concerning. One of the things that you said also, uh, like ethics is is like being ethical is uh, is taught in the home and in the school. And these past two years, the generation that was brought brought up that is still going through their develop, developmental stages. Uh, these two years were very imbalanced for them. And I can see it from the generations that we have, the younger generations. 
they're very extreme. One of one of the two extremes, there's no balance, and it's very concerning with the in the in the future is concerned. This is uh, how I see it. So uh, thank you, Lubna. This was a very valuable uh, input. So uh, okay. So moving on to the third section, which is the political culture and its impact on you. Uh, we're going to open uh, the questions and answers uh, in like twenty minutes. So if any one of the participants would like to send uh, their questions, please send them on the chat, just like Mahendra sent. sent. So, uh, so we get back to it in 20 minutes. So for the political culture and its impact uh, on youth, we uh, spoke about the media and how it impacts the youth and how it's, it's like it's used in politics, it's used in pharmacies and all of the services that are basically, they should be your right when it comes to ethics. So, um, so my question is to all of you, <laughs> if you'd like to answer, please just go ahead and start your answer. So my question is that during your journeys, uh, being from the global south, during your journeys, what, what were the challenges that you faced as a young person and especially as women, sometimes uh, as marginalized and minorities within the Asia Pacific region? Um, can you share the challenges that you personally faced that you have seen in other uh, marginalized communities uh, if possible? So, what would you like us to focus on as youth? Um, I can go first. Yes. Um, I think I think that my experience has definitely gone through, um, you know, the highs and lows of being um, very a very politically active person in South Australia. Um, I think that the biggest, um, I guess, barrier that I've personally faced is I have had so many meetings with politicians, whether they're state politicians or federal politicians, who, you know, they'll smile and nod and they'll listen, listen to you when you voice your concerns and then they'll go and do the exact opposite of what their whole communities are telling them to do. Um, because they want the extra vote, because they, you know, want to remain within the party lines and make sure, you know, they're not straying too far away. Um, I think that that's the, one of the biggest problems that we face as youth in Australia is that, you know, politicians are so focused on this aspect of power um, and trying to get, you know, another four years of having that power. And so that's really kind of, um, you know, it, it, it ruins your spirit a little bit because, you know, you'd hope that the people who are running your country and trying to make laws about you that affect you, they're going to listen. But unfortunately, sometimes that's not the case. Um, and I know that I can't speak from an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander perspective, um, but I've read many an article and spoken to many people about the fact that Indigenous people in Australia are so much more likely not to engage, not to engage in politics, not to engage in social justice, not to engage in any of these things because they have been constantly marginalised and, you know, discredited. Um, and it's really, it's really awful because they, um, you know, were, they were here before white European settlers you know they were here for over 60,000 years and they had their own laws and the connection with land and white Europeans just came and you know invaded and introduced their own ideas um and right now I know that there's the um Uluru statement from the heart which is being spoken about in parliament which essentially you know gives the land you know metaphorically back to the indigenous people um, as you know, custodians of Australia, 
um, but it also will provide um, Aboriginal people with their own advisory committee. And so any laws that are focused on um, within parliament that involve Indigenous communities, they will have their own say in it. Um, and that's just one tiny way that Australia, um, you know, the white Europeans can give that voice back to Indigenous Australians. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an issue and it's an ongoing issue and it's something that we have to work together to resolve, um, but it's not, it's not resolving too quickly, unfortunately. I see what you're saying. There's also uh, something that was, uh, that was repeated several times from Rula Tabathi to Lubna. Uh, all of you focused, uh, also you mentioned kind of the definition of tokenism. And this is used so much in politics. Like, oh yeah, we have somebody who's young, one person, and they don't have a say, or like we're the people who are puppeteering that person. But we have a young person, so be with us. It's like the same, it's the, the same goes for women, and the same goes for LGBTQIA plus communities. So the, the their representation in politics it's almost like it's creating a certain uh, amount of doubt in the people who are seeing the representation like even even when i see a young person it's like i look at that person and be like i'm not even sure if that person is actually representing me i'm not even sure if that person is representing the women or the young people it's uh it's also uh, it's bad it's like they're corrupting the small the smaller parts so that we are always in doubt so that so that we we don't believe in the system anymore and we let them be whatever they want to be yeah Rada. yes i i will say quickly to give time to dr lubna and to the you know public if they have questions you know, young women in many countries face double discrimination, first for their, for their age and for their gender. And in Lebanon, if they are independent, if they are, you know, independent from the political parties that are uh, dinosaurs and, you know, with all their <laughs> inexistent values and, you know, uh, power centered and around one person, it will be like a triple discrimination. So it will be harder for them. But please don't be in doubt, Aya. I don't want the young people to be in doubt. I want them to look around them to see where they can see anchors like adults who are big adults because you are adults adults who uh, old adults i prefer big than old you know who are who believe in you and who are ready to help you and see how you can really take and not take advantage negatively but how you can use this condition to really uh, access what where you want to go and i will be forever a friend of every uh, ethical use <laughs> who wants to do politics in Lebanon. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rila. Yeah, exactly. It's what, one of the things that the young people can do is to uh, hold on to a person who believes in them. That is a very good point. Uh, so like, uh, personally, in the Green Party of Lebanon, we, uh, we always try to keep the door open between the older generation and the younger generation, because this is an important bridge that needs to be built. Yes. And sometimes it is non-existent. And it's not only in our country, I have seen it in different countries. And it's a, con it's a concern. Because when yeah. the young people mm -hmm. don't know what happened before, they don't know what was the what the older generation tried when it was their time and how what what the things that they did led to the younger generation they just repeat the same mistakes and we go back into the same history yes and you it's, know, and uh, it's, i think it's, that the the old the the older generation shouldn't feel threatened by the younger ones exactly. and the younger ones sometimes if they look thoroughly or if they look well if they want to know more about the older ones sometimes they might find things that are okay and they would love to continue it instead of you know being rebellious all the way so i think you know we have to do we have to build a bridge like you said and to let yeah. the communication really pass yeah yeah uh, lubna your turn 
yeah i would like to flag in here some uh, very critical thing uh, because uh, even though there have been reservations uh, telling that uh, third um, some in uh, india you know both at the municipal level at the state level and at the union level at these three levels also we have sort of some seats which are reserved for women so that we ensure that a woman is definitely going into the council the uh, municipal stage the state stage and the union stage now what we have seen and which is very rampant sadly very rampant in our entire country is that even though a woman is elected over there it is not the woman in the picture at all after she is elected she is that symbolic face right from the election stage which you sort of tokenism that you were talking about and mm-hmm. after once after elected the it, it is so brazen that either the brother or mostly it is the husband who actually goes about the day to day for the entire five years of term telling that he is the corporator he is the person in charge over there so this is something very brazen that is happening it's happening right in my city hyderabad it's i tried to correct two people i mean when they were openly telling that they are corporators i said you are the husband of a corporator why are you how dare you call yourself as a corporator i had to call it out in in a public gathering i called it out so these uh, and people are not questioning him see again is the, the people who can make the change bring about the changes and especially the youth there why are the youth already per- buying that you know when everybody knows that the woman is the elected person and uh, the husband is telling oh, everywhere in his whatsapp in everywhere he declares himself as the elected person in even though he is not the corporator or the ml or in no he is not the elected person so uh, first of all the woman is allowing it to happen mm. and second thing is the citizens who most of whom are youth are allowing it to happen they are not questioning him i question some more many people have to question over there it's not being questioned and again comes the role of the election commission what is the election commission that and that oversee that election commission had overseen the entire election process and sent him to the council to the assembly and to the parliament what are they doing when he is doing this or is there a provision with them telling that any such misdeeds by any of these elected people whom we have sent to the parliament and the assembly and the council yes you may come back to us there is no such provision so these are the various challenges that even if it's a woman reserved seat also you have people starting about telling that the male person is the corporator such brazen yeah. it is <laughs> too many guts needed to do this yeah you you mentioned something that is very important to me because uh the questioning people to me uh this is an important point and uh it's important because every time i question <laughs> i get a backlash like why are you questioning no you don't know enough like i mean i might not know enough but i know that i need to question certain things because we need to get out of them we need to evolve like with our ideology you know i mean it's uh it's like they the society forces you to feel guilty to question yes. so this this evolves into not holding people responsible mm. and you the know, point here is that you must not be stopped for questioning rather exactly. if when if they te- if they are answering aya telling that you do not know then they are supposed to answer your question and let you know exactly that is very If true as it know then why are you not answering her and why are you telling her that questioning her questioning capacity she yeah. doesn't know you yeah. feel then you tell her the give her that knowledge you can't question uh, question her questioning capability or the questioning capacity mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. i agree Uh, Rula, you wanted to yes, interject. Yes, yes. questioning is a very good word. I was thinking about critical thinking. I think mm-hmm. one of the most important gift that you can give to others around you is to, is to help them develop their critical thinking, Aya. Uh, 
because this would really prevent you from believing anything that you will hear. It will help you to really understand more and examine and question and decide what is the media good, what is bad, you know, it will help you in the media literacy and to, it will help you in fighting populism. It will help you a lot in, in your life. So critical thinking is very important and it should be developed in school. I think Dr. Lubna talked at, at one point about education. It's very important. We should educate our kids, whether they are boys or girls, on developing their critical thinking. Yeah, true, true. Um, so, populism. So, populism is a kind of like a political stance that emphasizes the us and them kind of uh, group. It emphasizes the idea of people, the people, and then they uh, oppose that group against the elite, the elite. So to everyone, populism is the main cause for the degra degradation of democracy and the polarization, which, is, which might be based on religion, sect, uh, race, caste, citizenship, gender, uh, in any nation. Mm -hmm. So how, do, how can youth play a key role in bringing awareness to the society? So we mentioned uh, education. Education can come from the older, the older generations to the younger. May they be the elderly to the adults, the adults to the young, the young to the children, or it can be even exactly peer education. So, other than that, how can we raise awareness in society regarding uh, populism, regarding like, making sure that people realize that being put in this kind of situation makes things worse? Runa, go ahead. I will let the others also answer. I will just talk about a cup, uh, a two sisters, two Lebanese sisters. I don't know what Aya, whether you know them, uh, Michelle and Noel Kiserwani. They are singers, they are composers, and they compose songs on uh, the corruption of. Um, uh, of our politicians. So, so it could be, you know, via cultural activities too. In this way, you can reach, you know, all the population. So you can raise awareness of the young people through songs, with, and not only through conferences. I, could, I can talk about conferences, about classes, about webinars, wherever, but songs and art artistic uh, activities can be very helpful in really making them see, because populism is not easy to get rid of, unfortunately. And I think that it's here to stay for a while. And unfortunately, when you try to help people see the facts, you tell them, look, look at the facts. Look at the facts, they become even more, uh, how do we say it? more polar polarized <laughs> they would believe more and more they were believing in the first place so we have to find alternative ways to make them listen and to make them reconsider what they uh, think is right i get that uh lubna tabitha um yeah. yeah i absolutely agree with everything rola said i think that um you know these issues are just further polarizing people and you know making that harsh um you know discrepancy between young people and the older people um but i think that the best thing that we can do is bring attention to it call it out you know name and shame um i think is just the best way to do it you know because young people are at the front of you know so many issues um and acknowledging the role of populism through you know social media campaigns whether that be you know posting something on your story or making a video or you know those types of things you know organizing protests organizing meetings with politicians to talk about you know solutions to these issues the awareness of this is such like a larger issue and hopefully people will be um, awoken to this, you know, um, as Rula said, it's going to be around for a while, but what we kind of make of it and what we can do, you know, to try and aid it a little bit, any little bit counts, you know, just taking that first step in acknowledging that it's there and acknowledging its prevalence and then trying to work out from there different solutions and how to combat that. Thank you. Lubna, go ahead. Yeah. Um, carrying forward the word of uh, Raula Tabita, 
so populism for me you know uh, i think uh, films should not uh, is the main crux of the matter here apart when we talk about press it's a different thing altogether but here i am talking about films as such the film industry that's another chief thing that very much impacts the young mind mostly the young minds you know and uh, young minds are impacted and also uh, youth are also a part of the film industry so um, here you know i want to just uh, bring in this point there are three critical points that i want to touch here when telling when talking about films you know uh the number of assaults that i am i am bringing the gender part also here okay because the gender part cannot be ignored out of the film industry and especially when we are seeing a height uh, in increase on assaults on the women assaults on girls and in that critical stage what is the role of films there because in india we are seeing a huge role a huge uh, increase in assaults on women in multiple forms so there are there were three ips officers you know ips is a very topmost cadre of police in india indian police services so um, there you know uh, the three uh, uh, police officers in their uniform had actually gone out to the press after seeing so many cases that are coming to them in their uniform itself during the service they conducted a press conference and they actually told that uh, the they requested the producers of films to produce responsible films these responsible films it is their word that they used then when they told that it was imperative on the government which has an information and, and they have a film portfolio with them the government has it every government in the all the countries have it it was their responsibility to look into what these sitting ips officers are telling but till now there is no they never call them they to reason to what are all their observations that they came up with such a press conference statement till now they were not called for and they were female officers that's all that gives all the more credibility to those statements but till now that that responsible work never happened from the uh, film uh, ministry of films ministry of information and broadcasting they never did that neither at the union level nor at the um, state level nor at any level so this uh, populism you know which actually uh, i i want to just uh, bring into this point that the when a government or when a leader across the globe or in the country wants to spread something and which is which need not be a post truth you know understand you we are all conversant now with the post truth uh, statements in the post truth world so what's happening is when we keep on telling something that is not a truth but still it is going to be accepted as a truth so that's happening a lot now and uh, uh, given the time i want to also highlight i can't uh, uh, think of ending this uh, this discussion without bringing taliban into picture because in my opinion the most heinous crime today is being done by the taliban where it is locked up all its girls and women from studying what do you think about the politics there now who is going to enter into politics there who is going to rectify the poverty there who is going to question the american government who has locked up the finances of the taliban there who will question all this 50% of the population of afghanistan are women and out of that what about the huge population the entire women are subjugated there now and a huge youth population are not allowed to study and they are locked up so where politics where environment and what is the populism in afghanistan what is their populist generation and now they are calling upon the entire world to look at them in an humanitarian angle and send them the medicine and the food which of course the world has to do but what about their humanity and their ethics when they does allow the girls lock them up and tell them you cannot study by god this is the most heinous crime on the earth that is happening and another one point that i want to tell if i am permitted to apart from films that are impacting the way the people view a woman the objectify objectification of a woman that is being done through the films and through the ads is something that should not escape our discussion and also the taliban the heinous crime that it is perpetuating and apart from that the other point that i want to highlight is as because this is an india greens because the greens is an important part of this uh, 
platform that is conducting this very important discussion we will observe that in at least in cop 27 i hope this will be rectified in right up to kyoto protocol still this um uh, cop 26 never ever nuclear energy has been discussed threadbare and it has never been uh, classified under the energy that is polluting so what is happening only fossil fuels are now being termed as polluting and causing the global warming now what is coming down to the nuclear energy because they are not categorized as a polluting or a global warming emission they are now going in for our country especially is watching for this nuclear energy and they are signing nuclear energy pacts for all the countries the countries that are abandoning like germany is abandoning nuclear energy you know but india is watching for it india is signing uh, signing treaties for it with whether it is japan or america or with france or anybody so what i am telling is that i think india greens because it's globally present this uh, greens which is globally present they should make a impact at least in the cop 27 by way of pushing them to tell and to be clear about how if they are not categorizing the nuclear energy as a non pollutant and if safe are they categorizing it as a safe energy if yes how because the disposal the i mean japan is going to dispose all its nuclear waste in the sea and the world is alarmed at their decision and they either they're going to deposit in the deep continent depth of the seas which is which is going to harm the entire thing unpredictable things can happen due to this so why are they silent on that they can't be silent on that they have to take a stand because it's very very harmful unimaginable so these are the two points that i wanted to tell under your question on populism because the populism is now what is may be wrong but repeatedly mm. go on telling because popular and acceptable also so role of youth again yeah yeah definitely a lot of points were said my mind is turning <laughs> all right thank you thank you everyone for the amount of uh information and uh the knowledge the experience it's beautiful that you're pioneering in in each of your field, fields thank you and we're going to move forward with uh the questions from from the participants so uh the first one is from mahendra uh i'm not sure if he's still with us mahendra mandra is not with us anymore but it's okay so uh the question was how do we motivate or educate um or what are the effective ways that motivate and educate youth to understand the importance of youth of youth and active politics so this is a question that we kind of covered before but if anyone would like to add anything to the question please go ahead yeah i would like to add something to the question so because the youth youth these days feel that they are a political they don't want to engage in politics itself so how can we change this scenario when if some some person says i am a political i am proudly mentions about being a political so how can we change this scenario in the society so anyone can answer this people no i i can propose elements of uh, answer first maybe we have to redefine politics politics is about life is everything we do is everything we have is it's our right to be able to talk now to go to school to go to university to to go to be uh, to, to get access to medical you know treatment this is all politics it's not yes. only what some people might think don't first uh, sorry i speak french sometimes first redefine politics and then make the young people aware aware of themselves aware of others aware of the world aware of the issues that will affect them and let them see that if, if they don't do politics somebody else will decide for them is this what they want that somebody else will talk for them will decide for them and will affect their life i don't think so yeah may I, may i yes definitely yes. so uh, here two critical points i want to point out uh, uh, taking ahead uh, rola statement also see basically when a person is uh, uh, when you to ask a student about the most current affair of what is going on in the globe or in the country most of the students are blank 
they do not know i i think this is the case across the globe the youth are busy in their studies but studying what when they are not aware of the most critical things that's impacting actually their lives too their future too they say we don't know oh really this happened what when which newspaper which news they are asking us questions so we are shocked so the why this is happening is because the education is not experiential the ex education is just about a bookish knowledge and again about marks it is only about marks and about the future money so every chapter every chapter has to be connected with a current happening with the current news so that they may relate their education their knowledge with the current happening so that they can see how this knowledge this book knowledge this experiential knowledge is going to contribute to this particular happening in my city my state my country my globe unless that experiential thinking and that thing is brought about in the education not just about marks but the marks connected to this i think things will not change at all that is a, a very important thing that i want to bring another point that also discussed with akash very lengthy very we had a very lengthy chat actually where i told that it is not about having the conferences and about the webinars and other things but also about going choosing a particular street just the street with just 10 or 15 houses just an apartment with say 20 houses and turning out the topics there getting them to know the facts getting them through small flyers small flyers with just bullet points getting them to know the facts taking their opinion not just telling them but taking their opinion on what is the current happening many people will tell will for again put a blank face oh this happened that happened oh we didn't know this we didn't know that so this very my not even micro but nano the nano sort of awareness the nano sort of Uh, pushing into the streets and telling people that how do you think about this but if they tell some opinion but is this not the ethical is it not wrong but this is the fact but that is the thing so dialoguing with them and this dialoguing at the nano level and that education which will have an experiential learning connected totally at every chapter every day they have to be connected with the current topics unless this happen i don't think we are in for any good changes in the world or in my country or in my city yeah tabitha would you like to add anything um yeah absolutely i think akash you mentioned um being a political and more more and more people being a political i think that that sometimes comes from the lack of education as lubna was saying you know the lack of education and um people not knowing what is going on in their own country and around the world um i think that's very uh, dangerous i think that you know they're not exposed to the things that are happening so they can't be aware of them and they can't be engaged in that i think the other aspect of being a political is that the people who say they are are privileged enough to say they are they are privileged enough to be able to not care about what the government is doing because they know that they aren't going to be ridiculed by it they know that they aren't going to be negatively affected by it and so i think the people who are negatively affected by some of the choices that government government are making such as first nations people lgbtqia plus people you know those communities they know what's going on they know what's happening politically they know what laws are being introduced because it directly affects them and it directly affects them in a large way and so i think that the voices of the people who identify as apolitical and don't really care about politics i think that their voices are much louder but there is definitely a big community behind the people who do understand the importance of youth in politics um so i think that yeah that dissertion needed to be made yeah um sorry one second okay so uh we have another question that was sent on the group so we have uh from bharti uh politics has become a profitable business and also a means to protect criminals how do we change this scenario okay. 
maybe the first yes. thing to me is by making sure if you don't want to do politics yourself and to run for office, at least make sure that the people you will vote for are ethical people, they are clean people, maybe green if it is what you want, which may be green people also. You know, it, it's we have a say to say, we have the right and we have the duty to choose the right people for the right, you know, uh, governing position. Yeah, Lubna, Tabitha, thank you for the support on the Greens, Rada. I appreciate it. <laughs> I, I, uh... No, I would uh, appreciate if the youngster Tabitha goes ahead of me. Ah, Tabitha. Um, yes, I absolutely agree with Willa. You know, voting is the number one way to say whether you agree or disagree with a certain candidate. I mean, that's how they get in. And so that's how you can change what goes on in your community. I think the other big thing is just raising awareness. I mean, the people who are in power are unfortunately benefiting off of being able to be profitable from businesses and protecting criminals. You know, they're the people who are doing these actions. And so they're the people who are benefiting from the system that currently exists. And so, I mean, it is up to them to change it because through laws and policy, but they're not going to. So it needs real people on the ground, you know, protesting, marching, raising awareness, spreading it through social media. You know, these things that are happening, we need to be um, exposed to them. And we need to make sure that we, as citizens, are educated in our political systems and who's getting money from where, um, especially because in Australia, um, we have, you know, a certain limit on how much you can donate to a political party without, uh, with being anonymous, sorry, um, and it's $14,000, but they, so if, if, you, if you donate under $14,000, you don't have to put your name on the donation, it can be absolutely anonymous, and the dangerous thing about that is companies are just making lots of $13,000 donations because it's not a cumulative thing it's an individual donation and so they can donate as much as they want in little increments and the other thing about it is that if they do donate over $14,000 all at once their names don't actually get released to the public until six months later so they could be getting money for campaigning and for you know protesting and for all of their government things when election comes by, but we won't know who's investing in them until six months after the election results have been called. So it's putting a direct dampen on democracy um, and our political structures. So I definitely understand how um, it can kind of snowball and turn into um, a profitable a profitable business, um, which is something Australia definitely needs to work on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that being uh, the case in other countries even. Uh, Lubna, go ahead. Yeah, uh, in, as I told, pointed it earlier about these um, donations, you know, what the Tabitha has raised. We have these um, electro, the highly opaque and uh, non-transparent uh, electoral bonds here too. But there are so many other forms of corruption too that go on in uh, elections. Uh, the voting pattern itself and uh, that's how uh, we have uh, recently even the Supreme Court also was telling that the cases against the elected representatives have to be um, uh, have to be run on a very war footing, you know, on a very fast track basis. The Supreme Court itself also, also pointed out. And um, of course, we have the corruption indexes and our country uh, uh, rates very low on that. We have a very high corruption in our country. Right from the topmost uh, um, deals of the country till the uh, lowest excellence, everywhere we have corruption. And uh, sometime back, some uh, uh, our state government also, it tried to increase the salaries of the elected members telling that uh, so that they should not be corrupt, we are increasing the salaries. Mm -hmm. Then in that case, uh, if, uh, if elected representatives salaries should be increased so that they are not prone to corruption, then that applies to every other person who is a salaried person, every person's salary has to be increased then. But that did not happen. So these are um, 
you know they come up with weird things at times our politicians you know so uh, we are actually we are supposed to understand who we are electing uh, and i'll tell you one sad part of it you know this is the last point that i'm going to tell in this in this particular category is that you know um, people are it is it is a fact that people are electing their representatives based upon religion based upon caste they are not looking at the person they are not looking at the criminalness of the person at the uh, unvalued non value based things that the person has done in the past they are simply voting the person on the basis of the religion and i am i was appalled when actually i faced top leading bureaucrats who are retired bureaucrats that means the highest uh, services people who are retired they actually told me on my face that even though i don't like this like that person but still i have cast my vote to that person it was only because the person belonged to that person's religion this is how bad things are that they do not understand if i would simply say i told them on the face was this that if you are even looking at your religion and then voting that person you have not even followed your religion does your religion tell you that you vote for a person who has done critical really wrong things is that your religion so this is how bad things are so that is why i, I sincerely feel that uh, uh, at my very micro nano level handling things make people like as rola has also told make the critical thinking part of this they must face it they must face the the person who is supporting the criminal representative must face the question on the ground that why why are you still supporting in a very parliamentary way in a very way of dialogue i'm not telling is a conference is matter but in a matter in a manner of dialogue all this has to happen and the education the moral periods are out now from the in, in, at least i am an alumni of san francis school which is the top most leading school in my city of hyderabad but now we i had a moral science period every other week and every once in two days but now we don't have all that in the schools as if we are the world has reached at a very high degree of morals suddenly the moral periods are out of the schools <laughs> matter of fact we should have increased them so i think increase confronting the public with more and more of um high, moving them to more moral high standards at the schools at the homes and in the on the streets uh, dialoguing with people i think all these are very necessary for us to be a more progressive society a very more balanced and an inclusive society a tolerant society yeah uh thank you akash would you like to take over yeah i have another question like um, i don't want to put you guys in a trouble but uh, have you ever considered of running for office i know lubna ji has contested in few elections but i wanted to know personally from uh, kavita and rola as well whether they were considered for running for office and also the uh, question directed to lubna server as well uh, what are the obstacles or lessons learned throughout her journey yeah i did consider at one point i even you know i did consider seriously but what stopped me is not related to my person it's not related to me it's related to the system i don't know whether you are aware of it but in lebanon you present as your religion so i have to present myself as being you know christian orthodox christian and you if if there's if you don't find your place in the party if no party will back you up you there's no place for you as an independent and i never really wanted to you know sign it's like signing a check uh, without a fund you know and give it get to somebody and let them decide for you i would never be able to do this i have to be free if i want to go, to enter the parliament it's really to to bring something with me and to do something with my thoughts and to have an impact so i don't want to be there just to repeat what uh, you know the politicians that are established want me to do so that stopped here but uh, what i'm doing now by writing by by interfering by you know speaking at events you know in all the spheres where i work i can have an impact and that's wonderful for me thank you um yeah so i definitely have thought about um running in the future potentially um i still am only 17 so i've got some time to figure it out um i think that south australia and australia more broadly definitely need more women 
um, we just had, sorry to snowball into this, but we just had a um, state election a couple of weeks ago and the government now actually have 50-50 women in their party, um, which is brilliant. It's so good to see. Um, and so I definitely think that I have more of a chance now um, to be able to move into the political sphere. <laughs> yeah, all the best to Tavita. So happy to hear <laughs> at such a day engaged, you're so active. So um, yes, there were uh, Akarsh, yes, there were many impediments, there were threats. Um, actually, when I was uh, campaigning within my, my constituency is a woman reserved constituency when I was running for the councillor. And uh, on the street, when I was campaigning, just doing door to door campaigning, uh, the person uh, from the ruling uh, uh, regime here, they actually came and threatened me and they told me that, um, what are you doing here? Never enter this area again. You know, all those filmy type, you know, those, all those dialogues were heard. And uh, the, of course, the cases, uh, the, the police intervened and they are running the case uh, against the person who was seen. So it was captured on the video also. Some people had captured and it was very evident who was doing these threats to me. Uh, so that's one thing. And when I was running for a bigger office than that, that's the state assembly. The sitting, uh, that time, the, uh, the sitting person who was there, the MLA, he actually rushed into the polling booth with more than a dozen people, which is totally prohibited. As per the election rules, only the, pers elect, uh, the person who is running the office and the agent can enter. But he came into the polling booth with more than a dozen people. And then, uh, well, uh, I, he said, what, why are you questioning the presiding officer? What is all going on? I said, uh, why are you here if, in with so many people? And everybody will have to follow the rule. If the presiding officer is not overseeing the rule being followed, then I will question that. And you have, the, you have to follow the rule. I have to follow the rule. Then um, he hushed off and uh, the persons, they actually told me, you are speaking a lot of rule, rule. This is not good for you. Again, a filmy style. So again, the DJP uh, gave the report and the DJP himself, the, uh, the director general of police, who is the topmost police officer in the uh, state, entire state, they gave a report, official report, telling that, uh, yes, indeed, he had entered into the polling booth with more than a dozen people. But they, instead of a threat and all that, without even asking me, they have written there, that the uh, contesting candidate, the other person, had a discussion with Dr. Lubna Sarvat. It was not a discussion. I had an open thread there. And what about the big uh, violation of 14 people entering the booth? The police themselves are telling it was happened, but there was no action initiated on that. So there are some, there are these things that keep happening and uh, somehow we are still alive, <laughs> but... Um, they're happening and uh, this is a wrong part of it and police should have acted very fast even now they can act but they are still yet to take a concrete action a concrete action has to is yet to be seen rather thanks uh, uh, first of all i like to thank uh, aya for moderating this session and i like to thank speakers tabita lubna and rola for taking out their time and giving us a valuable insights about how the youth can participate in a political scenario and how they can bring the some kind of political change in our current deeply rooted uh, with the corruption and all these kind of power hungry people. So I would like to thank everyone as well who are, who are attended right now is attending. Uh, so this is a very fascinating session. Thank you, speaker. Uh, so I would like to conclude this session on the note that as we see the climate change emergency is at its peak, but social and economic inequalities are on the rise as well, especially in the Asia Pacific region. We suffer with two kinds of crises, a bigger crisis, social crisis and ecological crisis. So in this kind of a scenario, we must urgently need to aim for a change in politics and policy making. So we believe as an Asia Pacific in Greens organization, we believe the green politics is a way forward and six principles, ecological wisdom, social justice, participatory democracy, sustainability, and respect for diversity and non-violence. With these principles, we can create some kind of a change in the society and the politics. So these principles also can be help us to create sustainable, just, and inclusive communities where the rights of nature and people are safeguarded. So thank you everyone for attending today. Please 
look forward for other our, our upcoming sessions. We'll be coming up with different speakers and different other major upcoming pressing topics as well. So thank you everyone for participating today. Thanks.